Hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, been fascinating. Uh, I was invited here to speak about Narayana Guru's position, which is very much mine, but he might be embarrassed to agree to that. I don't know, but he can't be here. Uh, I've spent my life admiring him and his wisdom and uh, studying it, and I was very excited about this and wrote probably 70 or 80 pages of notes and great things to share, and you know, I kept paring it down and uh, finally wound up with nothing at all. So I have a few stories I can share. Uh, but a couple of key ideas about Narayana Guru, because I don't know if you all know him, but uh, those of us in the Gurukula tradition uh, are offended when he's called a social reformer uh, because he was primarily a mystic. And the social reforms came out of his mystical realization. It was not something that he set out to accomplish. It's just the natural outcome of the perfection of the universe within each person, which he actually came to live with intimately. Now, most of us aren't as dedicated as he is, so it's perfectly fine to go out there and accomplish all of the good deeds you can do. But we want to keep in mind also that the ideal, ultimate, absolute core of it is this neutral state that's non-motivated at all. And the sense of unity with all beings, not just all people, but all of life and all of non-life, comes from that place. Uh, I realize it's inappropriate for me to say much about that here because it's not your thrust, but that is what I teach and it's the basis of uh, Narayana Guru's philosophy and the Gurukula philosophy. I, uh, we have a, we've had a class in Portland for almost 50 years uh, regularly, and I do online classes. If anyone is interested in that sort of thing, you can uh, connect to my website through the program, or uh, at least online you can, and get in touch, and I'd love to go into more detail with that. So I, had, I, I loved the talks, and I had some good reactions. I jotted some notes, but um, you know, I, I was going to uh, thank everyone for inviting me to a civilized country. I'm from the United States, and we're having a terrible outbreak of injustice there, and uh, worse than usual. And I thought, wow, well, Canada is a civilized country. I'm so excited to go up there, and it'll be a nice break. And then after listening to uh, Chief Stacy, I realized maybe you're not civilized, but you are polite. So thank you very much for that. Polite is way better than what we've got going down south there. Uh, so, And I guess that touches on, uh, I, I did want to give a few, you know, pithy pieces of advice. Uh, and I don't know about Canada, I don't know much about it, but in the United States, uh, civics has been removed from the curriculum, high school curriculum, for pretty much since I was in high school. Right after that, it was considered uh, racist and imperialist and all of this, but it turns out that civics gives you a sense of why you're here and why you belong and why you matter. And getting rid of it was a corporate policy to cut people loose from their citizenship and make them consumers. And we're all now labeled consumers instead of citizens. But when I was young, I was raised to be a citizen, which meant I mattered. That's a huge, huge thing. So if you don't have civics, put it back in, jeez. I, we are fostering a young man who was, uh, we found in terrible condition, and he's now in residency as a surgeon. Uh, but when he was about 25 or 6, I was talking to him, 
And he was going on, I'm a consumer this, I'm a consumer that, and I told him, you know, when I was your age, we thought of ourselves as citizens. And he looked at me and said, I've never heard that before. That's amazing. So think about what, what the difference is. Are we consumers or citizens? And yogis are, are the best citizens, okay? Uh, I have a couple of quotes from my Guru Nitya and Nancy's Guru Nitya. I think are germane to this. A couple of my favorites from a book that Nancy uh, prepared on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. The yogi makes every effort not to be a howler telling untruths or a simpleton believing in something because somebody said it or it is written somewhere. Again, I don't know about Canada, but in my country, we're looking at under 10% of people who actually think about what they hear before they regurgitate it and shout it in somebody else's face. So yoga insists that we don't do that, that we think about what matters and we think about justice and fairness. Nietzsche also said, yoga is not a passive way of closing one's eyes to injustice which it often is treated as, I might say. If the yogi has a moral conscience, he or she has to challenge all three kinds of involvement in violence, greed, anger, and delusion. We, we, can, we usually can spot anger, but the greed and especially the delusion gets by us a lot. And yoga is the study of our own delusions and our own prejudices our own inability to see how wrong and unjust we are. And when we, we all think we're just and everybody else is unjust. But that's not just, that's not right. So uh, that's why yoga, real yoga matters. I, I don't know if you guys have seen the uh, YouTube video of what, if Gandhi took a yoga class, but you should look it up, it's great. Uh, because a lot of it's really trivial and absurd, and it's mostly just calisthenics, which come from yoga. But there's so much more to it. And what we care about in the Gurukula is the more to it part. That how do we get over being deluded? And that is what brings about justice. You know, Hitler and Mussolini and Modi and maybe even Trump think that they're bringing justice to the world, or thought they were. So that's not enough. You know, we all think we're right and everybody else is wrong and we're just gonna fix the world by correcting other people. But this really does have to come back to ourselves. Yeah. And uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. One thing, uh, when Anakshi was speaking, that struck me uh, as an exercise you could do. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, talk, but when you watch it on the video, if that gets processed, substitute the word life for art. Life is creative, creativity in action. Life is a creative art, okay? Life is the most creative art. And we shouldn't limit ourselves to think, well, there's artists and they do all these creative things and we're just regular people and we just work in a bank or you know, we drive a train or, or we're a firefighter like I was. It's all great. Everything is art. And that, again, is the yogic message. Don't separate anything out. Live your life as an art form, as if you matter and you're beautiful and cosmic and all of that. So, oh yeah, another quote from Nitya. And this was because, you know, people don't know how to love unless it's been modeled for them. So we have to model love and compassion, all these positive virtues that are really, you have more of them here, but a lot of the world is missing them badly. And Nitya said, it is not difficult 
to cultivate an awareness that is both critical and sympathetic. We're not, we're not buying any of this junk. It's obviously wrong, but we're sympathetic. So we understand why people think that way, and we're going to listen to them. In fact, I listened to a TED talk this morning about just that from uh, one of the most extreme groups in uh, America. Uh, this woman was uh, converted out of it because people took the time to talk to her. And, and these are people who are deaf to anything. There's no way to get through their deafness and their meanness and their hate. But people tried really hard and they got through to her. That's also a wonderful talk. Um, what is it? I can't remember the name of it. But I've seen them around down there just, just raging at everybody. Um, anyway, the point is very simple. We need to communicate. We need to uh, not think of us in terms of us and them, as Nancy also said this morning. It's all of us together, and we have to find ways to do that, really do that. There's one favorite story I want to read. Um, Nancy also mentioned Atma Padesa Satakam, the 100 Verses of Self-Instruction, as a work filled with uplifting messages of how to get over our delusions and make a really meaningful life, just like Narayana Guru did, who, by being in tune with the bliss of the universe converted an entire region of the globe to a much better society. Just inspired it. He didn't ever, I gotta tell one more story. My favorite story of his intelitary, he's giving a speech to a vast crowd and giving his basic speech of, you know, we have, we're all of one God, one caste, one religion. And one caste, of course, means no caste. There's no caste if there's only one caste. And it's the same with the others. You can either take them or not. It's not that my God is better than your God. It's just that there's one thing that some people call God and some people call Brahman and some people call Allah. So anyway, he's giving the speech and there's a disturbance way in the back. He says, what's going on? And people shout up, there's this boy trying to get in. This untouchable boy is trying to get into the, the talk. He's trying to come into our group. Even the people listening to him didn't get his message. You know? So he said, bring him here. And they're all thinking, well, that, he's going to lambast that little kid for invading us here. And he just had them put a chair next to him and sat the boy down and Never said a word, he never lectured anybody, but a lot of people got the message right there and rethought their position. Uh, that's the kind of example that was, you know, the unmoved mover, the uh, inaction, inaction, or the other way around, if you prefer. We don't have to fight people, we just have to do it right. And we're, we have a lot to learn in that department. Uh, at least I do. but. I'm trusting that some of you do too. Anyway, one, one uh, good story from uh, 100 Verses of Self-Instruction, Atmopadesa Satakam. Nietzsche's uh, book on it is called That Alone. You can get it from DK Publishers or uh, you can talk to uh, us about it. Uh, magnificent story. Okay, I'll get right to it. Um, and it's about verse 46, um, and it's about the, our urge to fight for justice. Narayana Guru says, by fighting it is impossible to win. By fighting one another, no faith is destroyed. One who argues against another's faith, not recognizing this, fights in vain and perishes. This should be understood. And I got it because our anti-war uh, activities of the 60s included hating and disdaining the people who were, you know, slaughtering people, obviously very hateful people. But our very hatred and nastiness and unacceptingness gave them so much energy. That was the seeds of Trump. 
that right there. We didn't know we were planting that. We were kids. We didn't know anything. But our enmity, said, they, those people said, man, we're going to get back at those guys. And we'll show them. And they're really showing us now. We're, we're being wiped out. We didn't even know it was coming. But here's what Nietzsche said. And you might know this myth yourselves. Instead of fighting, first he introduces it. Instead of fighting you, I allow you to be. I do not merely allow you to be. I also include you. I accept you. When I accept you, I have already taken the zest to fight away from you. In the face of my calmness, you also become calm. So if winning is your motive, win the heart. When you fight, not only does the other perish, you also perish. There's an Indian myth that a certain demon came and challenged Balarama, the brother of Krishna. Balarama accepted the challenge. He went, raising his fist to smash its head. Then the demon became twice the size of Balarama. Seeing this, Balarama, who had psychic powers, grew double the size of the demon. The demon doubled in size again and started lifting hills to throw at him. Then Balarama realized he could not overpower the demon. He turned to Sri Krishna and asked for help. Sri Krishna smiled and said, Brother, leave him to me. I'll deal with him. The demon turned to Krishna and found that in his hand there was no weapon. Krishna stood with his hands open and smiled. Then the demon became the size of an average human being. Krishna still stood there with his bewitching smile and said, come on, friend. He came close and became smaller than Krishna. Krishna patted him. He became very small. Then Krishna took him in his hand and stroked him. He became so tiny. Then Balarama came and said, brother, I don't understand this. How did he become so small? How did you tame him? He replied, brother, don't you know this demon's name? No, this demon's name is Kroda, anger. When you become angry, you are only feeding him. He thrives on somebody else's anger. When you take away your anger, there is nothing to nourish him. He becomes less and less. So when I give him love, there is nothing on which he can feed himself, and he becomes very small. This is also the central teaching of Buddha. With hatred, you never appease hatred, but with love, you win all. Thank you.